Thank you for listening to today's episode. I just wanted to inform all of our viewers and listeners that the channel has a new affiliate code to share. If you're looking for a wig for an upcoming cosplay or to complete your Halloween costume, check out the Five Wits Wigs. You can use the code listed in the description for 10% off your purchase of one of their high quality wigs. Also, a small reminder, if you're new here, I share all comments from our episode posts with the cast. Whether you're a member over on Patreon or just a casual listener of fine TTRPG broadcasts, we love hearing from each and every one of you, especially your red string theories. Thanks for supporting the show, and uh, I guess let's just get on with the story and catch up with the cast. everyone my name is sitin your favorite sitin on the internet um tonight i will be playing yuiza our wood elf witchblade rogue uh and she uses she her ayushi they that's hi i'm zachary vaudo i am playing arat chijin the damphir wild oracle class wild oracle class being from the aforementioned weird works uh any pronouns so long as they're not derogatory <laughs> Yeah, they, I'm Abby. I'm going to be playing our huling cleric of Keating, Fiskorf, and my mom picked up my pronouns, so we're both she, her. Hey, everybody, I'm RJ. Today I'm playing Sulong Shen. We both go by he, him, but he is a Zarin druid bard, a uh, barbarian, and I am just a general uh, menace. Awesome. And that just leaves me. If you don't know me yet, hey, everybody, I'm Sarah Roberts, a.k.a. The Hype Goblin. I use any pronouns. And tonight I will be playing the world that these fine folks are going to be exploring. So last we all left off, you we were taking in the show at the fair as it was wrapping up. The bartender from the local bar just finished his set and everyone is sort of milling about and heading on out Arabelle and Zasfel, the mayor and the uh, woman that you have been staying with recently. They walk over to you, both of them smiling Zasfel with his unnaturally white Ryan Seacrest-like smile. Just, oh, I am so glad that you were able to make it tonight. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves and your free ticket. Are you ready to mosey on towards dinner? At my estate, of course. Uh, certainly. Thank you very much for the hospitality. Yeah. You own your own estate? <laughs> of course. My family has been on the land for generations now. It's, it's a lovely place. I cannot wait for you to come and see it. Right this way, please. And Arabelle gives a nod and leans over to you, Fiskorthan. His family's actually kind of been running this place for a very long time. There are what a oh. lot of... um. A lot of people would call old bunny. Bourgeois, of course, of course. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Come on. And they will take you over to a set of two carriages. They get into the first one and you four are ushered into the second one. And they are lovely carriages. 
the inner lining is velvet and plush. The seats are comfortable. You barely feel the bumps in the road as you begin traveling through town. Do you have any conversation as you begin your journey? I think this is the most expensive thing I've sat on. Yeah, a lot of flair for just taking us out to dinner. I feel like we're going to be dinner almost, really, with the way he was flashing those gnashers at us. I think that's just kind of like a he thing. I don't think that, um, I mean, he can definitely try, but, you know, he's not going to win. I certainly hope not. If he is this uh, old money that Arabel said, then it sounds like he has more than he knows what to do with. So showing off for those around him. So is it like they've inherited the power to like um, rule here through blood? Isn't that like a monarchy, right? Or like a oligarchy? Normally, yes. Uh, if he's calling himself the mayor, I would assume that he is being elected, but it could simply be that nobody is running against him. Another question to ask over dinner, perhaps. Indeed, about campaigns and funds and misuse and why he feels the need to compensate with extra pumped up carriage wheels, truly. What is he compensating for? It was such a whole, whole ride. I did hop. Hop, I tell you. Sulong's leaning against an arm chest, just looking out the window. And you know, if he has a lot more money than he knows what to do with, why didn't he invest into the town? That is, that is true. Uh, the town does not seem in quite the disrepair that I've seen. Other, I've experienced other places, but if he does have this much money, it certainly could be more. At the very least, pave the roads. Also, like, did you remember that old gentleman that uh, we found in his farm? Of course. No one had to look after him, and his place is in disarray. There wasn't even thing, like anything to take care of the community. Is that not, like, normal over here? Are we going to ambush the mayor with paparazzi questions? That's the main question. Well, we will be sitting at dinner and we need to have something to talk about to distract from everything else. So perhaps pearly white teeth and uncali valley. Uh, I'm going to continue to take your word from it. But uh, yes. It's better that you're blowing in this case. It is terrible. As you're all traveling along, those who are looking out the window, roll me a perception check. Just like my humor, 12. <laughs> okay. 16. Okay. 8. Okay. I see everything. Uh, you know what? It's golf rules, actually. Trying to roll low. <laughs> For those of you who rolled above a 10. Fiskworth and Su Long, you're, you must be sitting on the same side of the carriage looking out the same direction. As you are moving along, you both notice a rather heated-looking euphoria dragging along Connie by the arm. You can't quite make out what's being said. However, she looks very upset and Connie continuously rolls her eyes at her as she tugs her along the street towards the tailor shop. Well, at least she's not in danger. I wouldn't necessarily be rolling my eyes if I felt I was about to be turned into clothes. Yeah, but knowing Connie. Mm. What happened? Oh, uh, we just spotted Euphoria dragging Connie over to the shop, and Euphoria didn't look very pleased. Connie seemed to indicate that uh, she might not be happy with certain outcomes today when we ran into her earlier, I believe. Mm -hmm. And isn't, like, Connie always saying to, like, steer clear of Euphoria? Strange, and yet there she is, but, well, not barreling headfirst in and being dragged right into the whole mess. We should ask after her after this meal and we find the axe and the dagger and all those things that were asked of us. Really, he's, if he's so rich, why didn't he just buy them? Why'd you just take them? Terribly rude. Terribly bourgeoisie. Uh, he, uh, I believe he, he won them under particular circumstances. I believe uh, at least one of them was a, was a wager, yes? Yes. So long? Uh, yeah, I believe so. so it's just feeling if you ask me. So we have to take back the sacrificial dagger. Nismat's axe and find out like the maiden the butler broke up. DM, how loud is how loud is it when we're like riding in the carriage? Is it is there a lot of like atmospheric noise? You hear the sounds of the town and people walking by, and slowly as you near the other side of this town, it's not of as you all know, it's not a very large 
town. There's only a few buildings in the main thoroughfare that you're traveling through. Further past the temple and further past the bathhouse, slowly the sounds of this the area fade away and you only hear the sounds of the forest as you move the carriages move into the trees and you head further into the forest towards the mountains. I, I should re, I should rephrase my question. What I'm trying to do since I can't visually mm-hmm. check is I'm trying to see if the the dialogue inside the carriage can be heard outside of the carriage, in particular no. by like the mm-hmm. driver. No. Okay, so just listening. Just, mm-hmm. And just go. Yes, we, we do have quite a few things that we need to take, which is why I think perhaps distracting him with some of these questions might be useful. Keep his mind off of anybody who might excuse themselves away. So, um, do we have a plan on how we're going to do this? I am a bit of a, shall we say, a distracting force myself. I don't think I could skulk about a mansion, but I could keep the mayor busy with all my questions. And more importantly, I want to interrogate a capitalist. I have many questions for him. I was just going to say, could I use your bathroom and then wander around the manor for a while? If anything is in the immediate vicinity, I have a way, I have ways of retrieving it. Otherwise, I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't know what I'm looking for in the first place. So, I mean, uh, I'm pretty good at skulking. Yes, uh, I believe that uh, Fiskort and I could quite possibly remain at the table and be distraction. As I said, if there's anything within the uh, within the, the area, such as keys or whatnot, you can let me know. And uh, with this uh, new ability, I may be able to actually retrieve them from wherever I'm sitting for you. But you two should probably be the ones to explore. All right. Um, so long, do you want to like get to your gossip? Right. Got to figure out why the maid got the let butler. off. Like got, got off. What's going on? Uh, <laughs> Mayor's main butler broke off their engagement. You have a right trustworthy face. I am sure she will spill all her secrets to you. That is very Just true. Use your person skills. Mm-hmm. I have person skills. Yeah, they me. like super seed. Su Long looks down at his arm. <laughs> No, it's pretty salty to me. There's not a thought behind those eyes, is there? Only the ones that we put there. Yeah. Well, I can go and walk around and try and see. Maybe maybe we can uh, ask him some questions. Like, wow, a man like you with so much money and wealth, you must have a really cool, like, weapons collection. Where is it? That might be a bit on the nose, but we could perhaps... We could perhaps steer the conversation towards towards all the things that he has to show off. His martial prowess, his velvet, his hoard of money, which he needs to be returned to the common people. How he gets his teeth so sparkly, sparkly. That's true. He likes to show off, so maybe we can ask him for like a tour of the estate. You know, like, wow, it's so great. Oh my god, you're amazing. And he'll be like, oh my god, yes, let me show you how amazing I am. Perhaps a tour yes. of the estate before dinner uh, would be would be useful. Then we could at least get an idea if there are any rooms that he is not wanting to show us versus things in, in plain sight. It will let me know what place I don't need to go into and what place I would need to go into. So, of course, and if we are if we are wanting to see see weapons on display, perhaps we can show some of these ones that uh, were crafted in town to oh, spark true. a conversation. Mm-hmm. As you all have this conversation and do your plotting and planning and scheming, the carriages come to a stop and they stop outside of a grand manor. The area in this part of the forest, the land has been cleared away and you see lush lawns and gardens that stretch on all beautifully manicured and maintained. There are trees not native to this area thriving in the gardens. And as you step out, you cross the threshold of this large three-story structure. The threshold of the manor features large stained glass windows depicting the family crest and their rise to good fortune. 
Two large ornately carved oak doors open and reveal an ostentatiously tiled floor mosaic that transitions to beautiful parquet wood flooring topped by lavish rugs. The wood paneled walls are stained a deep brown and adorned with paint paintings and portraits. And standing at the doorway, giving a slight bow to Arabelle and Zasafel as they walk in before you, is a small goblin man in a butler's uniform and a half orcish woman in a maid's uniform. Thomas, the butler, and Mari, the maid, both greet you. And Thomas steps forward and says, Oh, hello. Can I take your coats and your weapons, please? We'll be locking them up for safekeeping here as we do not allow weaponry on the premises, per the master's orders. If we're attacked by a dragon, we'll need them. <laughs> Don't worry, dear. We have not had a dragon attack here in many years. I suppose so. She will take two daggers from each one from each boot and mm -hmm. hand them over. Okay. And take her short sword and hand it over. Okay. I take the walk walk dagger that's out of like out of the uh, the front of the of the coat and present it over, and that's it. Sulong will hand over his coat, which has the dagger like tucked into the lapel. All right. This will hand over her crossbow, but I'll keep my little pee face. Mari and Thomas take your items and store them in a large, beautifully carved oak cabinet. And then Thomas comes back before you all in. <clears throat> Madam, would you care to relinquish your other weapons as well now? And stares right at you, Yuisa. He rolled a natural 20 on his perception check. I mean, these good looks, like, I have to stay with. They're kind of mine, you know? Fine. She will take off her braces. All right. He takes those as well, and with a nod, hands them over to Mari. She locks them in the cabinet for safekeeping for you all. And Thomas informs you all, we will be returning all of these at the end of the night. Is there uh, any dietary restrictions I should inform the chef of for you all? Blood. Uh, I can say mainly that. Uh, I'm not saying I need your blood. I, I understand that's a common misconception. I am vampiric in nature, but I would like consensually obtained blood, please. Better we are more than happy to serve. Anyone else? I can't have too much dairy. I will make sure that the chef is aware. Um, what is your utensils made out of? I'm allergic to iron and silver. And gold, it will be for tonight. I believe the master of the house requested the finest of finery for you all. Right this way please. And he gestures to you all to follow him into the house further. Very quietly, I just go, I just lean over to you and go, you, you are allergic to those? Yeah, I get really bad rashes when my skin touches them. While we're walking, can I slip a fan into like Yuiza's back pocket? Roll sleight of hand for me. Rolling hot tonight with an 18. Okay. All right, he rolled an 11. So yeah, you do manage to slide one of your fans unnoticed into Yuisa's bag. While they're talking, can I watch the maid and the butler interact? Like, I want to see if I can get any hot tea and maybe Pierce, who's the best to talk to in this case? Sure. As the butler leads you to the drawing room, you are definitely able to look over Mari as she walks away. Go ahead and roll me a insight check. You know what, baby? That's a 21. They appear to be uncomfortably polite around one another. You've seen this before in the caverns with those who were hoping for a love match, but then their hopes were squandered probably by their parents. After failing a duel or a fight, oh, they are, but why would they be polite to each other? Curious, usually we would have just torn each other's throats out. 
Thomas will lead you all over to a set of doors on your left and open them wide. They slide into the walls. He gestures for you all to enter to the drawing room. The drawing room's high wood paneled walls are stained the same dark brown as the entry hall. Opposite the door is a grand marble fireplace and upon the mantel sits an intricately, intricately designed brass hourglass. Hanging above this in a place of honor is an ornate battle axe. The seating is plush and lush fabrics grace each chair and love seat. A few bookcases line one wall. The windows overlook lawns and lush gardens and beneath them sits a chess set and two chairs. If you would all join uh, Miss Ellison and Miss Arabelle in the drawing room, dinner will be served shortly. I will go and make sure that the chef meets all of your requirements for the evening. If there's anything I can get you all in the meantime, please let me know. I'll be back with refreshments as well. And oh, oh one moment. And Thomas crosses the room and inspects above the fire mantle. Ah, forgot to polish it. One moment. And takes the large battle axe from the top of the fire mantle and takes it out of the room with him. Su Long, roll me a perception check. 19? You notice that the axe, as he carries it out of the room with him, is very similar to the description that Nismat gave you of the battle axe that you were intended to find. Uh, oh, uh, Thomas, how much longer do you think it would be until dinner starts? Oh, uh, that will depend on the chef, sir, but I believe that we should have it ready for everybody in 20 to 30 minutes. Miss Ellison will be playing the piano for you all in the meantime as entertainment, and we will have drinks and small refreshments out shortly. Would you mind terribly if I were to... Uh, this is awkward of me to ask. Maintain that axe. I need to do something with my hands otherwise. Uh, no, this is a, uh, a very special item of the Masters. I do not let anyone else touch it. If you would like something to do, uh, there is a chest set near the window, sir, and there are a few uh, decks of cards in one of the armoires as well. You are more than welcome to help yourself to those. And now, if you'll excuse me. And he bows slightly to you and to the rest of you and heads back towards the kitchens. And you are left in the drawing room. Arabelle greets you all. Make yourselves at home, as he said. I think he's going to be bringing out lemonade shortly. You've all met Allison, right? And the redheaded woman sitting at the table, Zasafel's twin sister Allison, turns and greets you all with a warm smile. Hello. Yes, we did meet briefly, I believe. It is lovely to see your face. Does she have the same white teeth as him? No, she does not. She has a. She has the practice warm demeanor of the ever gracious hostess that mm -hmm. someone in her station would be expected to have in a house this grand. Um, this is a very beautiful home. Is it your family home? Oh, <laughs> yes, we've been here for a very long time now. I believe I believe our great, 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 great grandfather is the one who originally made a deal with the the custodian of the lands to take it over and, and maintain it. Well, that's a lot of greats. <laughs> oh, was, yes. was somebody here before the town? Oh, yes. Our family has been there here for a very long time. Oh, I meant I meant uh, the, the aforementioned custodian was, some, was something here before the town. Oh, yes. Well, all land belongs to somebody before it belongs to the current owner. Does it? In most cases. Um, would it be terribly rude for me to ask if we could have a tour of this beautiful house? Oh, I'd be happy to give you a tour after dinner. That would be honestly delightful. I think, um, I think my brother has charades planned after dinner and I would very much like to avoid them. Then we can go on a little tour, it's fine. While I am... I, I, I tend to agree with you in this. Would he not be upset if you took all of the potential people to play charades with him away? during charades. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'm sure that we can do something to distract him. I'll just tell him that he has a smudge on his shoes and he'll run off for a few minutes. 
Maybe an hour. Perhaps play in this challenge of charades. I am, after all, very skilled in the art of production and performance. I was a cleric, you see. Oh, wonderful. Well, if you would like to play with him, you are more than welcome to. I'm going to give everyone a very distinct look and look. You know when you wink, but you really don't know how to wink? Okay. Um... So you play music. Thomas said you would play some music for us. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, I'd be happy to, if if you all don't mind. Oh, we would love to hear your music. You seem like a very talented woman. <laughs> do any of you play? And she begins to sit herself down at the piano. I don't play the piano, but I play the lute. Oh, oh what do you know? Well, I'm more of like a like a free free handing like music a little bit. I ha- I wasn't really like taught with like classics, but I could my ears really good. Well, and then, I could match what you're doing. <laughs> then by all means, feel free to join in if you'd like. Anyone else? I played the church organ. I would love to join you. I love pickling the ivories, as you might say. Very well. I will be. I would be delighted if you both would join me. Uh, please come, join me. Escort's never played the organ. We're gonna see how this goes. Okay, <laughs> that is right. Do you both have performance proficiency? No. Go ahead and roll performance for me. Let's see how well you are following along with Ellison's playing goes. Oh God. I'm gonna cast cast thaumaturgy. <laughs> Because I'm a little goofy. Nine. Same, a nine. Okay. It's a rather complicated tune. You both have a bit of trouble following along with it. However, as she realizes the extent of your musical prowess, she slows down to a more common tavern song. It's something that you two have both heard played in the Pink Dragon. And by ear, you're both able to kind of pluck along with her and join in a little bit more accurately to the second song. Sulong and Arad are playing cards and Sulong just has this look of consternation on his face. She's like, how are you beating me? You're distracted. You're distracted. You're, you're playing against Arat? Yeah, I'm playing against Arat. You've gotten three full houses in a row. I'll, I'll just feel the cards and go. Oh, so I have. Two gold gets thrown across the table in frustration. <laughs> Sulong will sink down into the chair pouting. Uh, DM, I actually, I want to I do something Mm-hmm. While everybody is focused on other things, I'm going to do scrying to see if I can find the card I'm looking for before I before I do this pull. Within my my card hand, I'm going to draw one of my own cards. Fortunately, this was the second one down, and it's the two of constructs. I'm going to fit it into into my hand, but I'm going to whisper to it. I want to pull the uh, the clockwork weasel out of it because they're all tiny creatures. Okay. And I'm whispering, I'm actually going to go ahead and describe uh, the dagger, like with the raven handle. Okay. And I just want to tell it to go, I want to tell it to go see if it can find it. My hope is that, All right. worst case, it gets mistaken for a rat. Does it have a stat block? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's just, it, it's just marked as a tiny creature and it's a weasel. Okay. Just roll me a straight d20 for it. Okay. And we're going to do a perception check. A 17. Actually, investigation. 17. Okay. I will I will hang on to that in the back of my little DM brain for now. Okay. Uh, yeah. You send your weasel off and it slips out of the room unnoticed for now. What do the rest of you do as you wait? Any like mice, spiders, small critters around in the room? In this glorious mansion? Never. Damn it. I've got to speak with animals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else before the host comes in? Uh, yeah, actually really quick, because there's there's okay. actually three animals that come out of, that come out of the card. Uh, okay. I just sent the weasel off because the other two are an owl and a cat, and those are a little bit more noticeable, even if they're tiny. Uh-huh. So those are actually just going to go like sit in my sleeve and okay. just hide, hide for now. Sounds good. Got something hidden up your sleeve. I like it. As you all play your card games and play a few tunes. Zasifel does return shortly after the refreshments has been served. Uh, ah, yes. Pardon me. I went and freshened up for a few moments. Are you all ready for dinner? I believe that the chef is is ready to serve. 
I am speedy. so hungry. Certainly, yes. I, that, that, yes, no, as, as, as Fiskor said, it's rather quick. I'm surprised. You must have oh. quite the staff. I only hire the best. Right this way. And he will lead you through another set of double doors that slide off into the wall. And you walk into a large dining room. Beyond these sliding wood and glass doors separating the room from the drawing room sits a long grand table with gilded plates and cutlery. Above the table hangs a exquisite crystal chandelier that scatters light that dances across the room. After a few minutes of polite conversation about the weather and the drive here, the first course is brought out to you all by the chef, the butler, and the maid. There is a large feast that is set before you of many dishes, some familiar, some not, all on uh, plates that are plated with gold, not silver, and no iron is to be seen in the room. What do you do? This is the most tamest you've ever seen Su Long eat. Was I given my meal in a cup or have I gotten like actual solid meals? Because we're about to see Fist use utensils for the first time. <laughs> you are served with a large chalice-like goblet. Your whole meal is easy for you to pick up in this, and it is exquisitely decorated as well. Oh my god, they gave me a Bloody Mary. I did. Just sneak a, a, a sip over to Arat. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm doing that gross couple shit. Like, I'm... No, don't I'm do gonna, that! Uh, <laughs> and then, like, I pass it over to him. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to, I, I will discreetly take some because I'm not disclosing what I am to the mayor here, but mm -hmm. I also didn't correct him on anything to get me for food. So yeah, just okay. at some, at I some mean, point. If at some point, someone like, has noticed Fizzkorth passing stuff to Arad, he will engage the mayor in conversation. Just like, mm -hmm. woe is me, I'm a podunk town boy coming in to this like wondrous mansion. What exactly does charades taste like? We had oh, lemonade before. <laughs> oh, my fine young man. Charades is a it's a game. It's not something that you eat. One person oh. pulls a idea out of a hat, which we will all submit later. That's part of the fun of it. And then you act it out in front of the group and your team will split off into teams. We'll try and guess what you are acting out before the time is out. And you cannot use any words or sounds. You can only gesture with your body and act it out. It's delightful. I, Good fun. Uh, I, I may have to sit this one out, then I apologize. Oh, well, we could add an, um, an auditory portion of it, if you'd like. Well, I wouldn't want to go against the spirit of the game. Ah, I understand. Still, someone will narrate for you. We call it Pictionary, where we're from, but instead we draw what we're supposed to be. But I might be able to help make it auditory for you. I could echolocate. That actually would. That that would certainly, uh... That would certainly make me able to see it. Uh, might disrupt the game a little bit, but... Echolocate. Oh, that does sound delightful. Do you use your echolocation often, my dear? And he what smiles his big toothy smile at oh. you, Fiskor. You know, I, by instinct, I immediately go to answer, but I am immediately off put by those bearing of teeth. I just, oh, um, well, I lived in caves for much of my life, so it was a part of life. You see, I'm still getting used to the light above here. Really, it's so bright. How do you manage? Your teeth are so bright now. <laughs> oh, well, it is delightful that you are on the surface with us now and enjoying everything that it has to offer us. Isn't that right, dear? And he smiles over at Arabelle and she gives a plate. Mm-hmm. She leans in as well and says, Fiskworth is even learning how to cook and has been trying her hands at making breakfast food. She has. She's been doing mm -hmm. really well. Can I perhaps make you something? I, I would love to try it out. And uh, perhaps you could show me your kitchens and we could thank the chef. Yes, we should go. You should take me there. Yes, please. <laughs> and Zasfil raises his hand and shakes an oh, no way sort of gesture. I, <laughs> I would not dream of getting in the way of the chef when she is in her element. She runs the kitchens here with an iron fist and one wrong move. And I'm, I'm afraid to say that you may lose a digit. You only have to 
Do toes not count? Typically, I don't believe that people have those out in a kitchen. Sanitation reason. Are you going in the kitchen anyway? <laughs> oh, absolutely not. Um, he scares okay. me too much. Those oh, okay. teeth are made for killing. Uh, so I noticed in your garden you have a variety of trees. Um, all imported, I assume. Oh, yes. My great-great-grandfather, he was quite the traveler. He and his partner spent much of their, their time traveling the world as much as they could when they weren't here looking looking after things themselves, that is. You hmm. have a lot of... And do you grow, like, food for the house or, like, for other people or... We do maintain a small garden, but we try to purchase as much as we can from the local farmers here. Oh, that's really good. That's... You're yeah, giving back to the town. You make a habit of keeping collections aside from your most glorious gardens. Oh, why, yes, of course, my dear. We have some of the finest paintings in the area. I would love to see them. Your sister uh, offered herself to uh, give us a tour after dinner. Oh, wonderful. She is the most wonderful hostess. Our mother taught her very well. And Ellison gives a polite nod of her head as her spoon dips into her soup bowl and she daintily slurps. Meal. I saw that you had a, a great axe in the drawing room. Are you an avid collector of weapons and blades as well? Oh, yes. Uh, we actually have several suits of armor as well from hmm. around the continent. My favorite is one that my father brought back. He traveled north for quite some time and he brought back one that is uh, exquisitely trimmed out in some rare furs. Did the weapon come with it? Your the man that brought us in seemed very proud of taking care of it. Oh no, that is part of my personal collection that I have I have maintained for myself. I'm a, a avid collector too of beautiful objects. Is that why you're dating Arabelle? <laughs> Don't objectify Arabelle. Uh, Arabelle blushes slightly and. It gives a small chuckle behind her hand and Zasfel reaches out for her other one. And I could not possibly fathom anyone more beautiful in the village than Miss Arabelle. I am delighted that she decided to accept my request for courtship. How long have you two been together? Oh, gosh, dear. How long has it been? Just just a month, I believe. It feels, feels like we've known each other forever. And Arabelle nods and yeah, it's... It's only been about a month since I've been back. It all kind of happened rather suddenly. We met in the markets one day and it was just, I don't know. There was just something in the air, I guess. That's such a beautiful meet cute. <laughs> Thank you. And as you're uh, talking about this relationship, the dining staff comes in and removes your plates. Oh. and serves you again with a fresh course. This is a, a heartier course. It's more, there's more meat, potatoes, fist court. This time you are brought a, a substance that is the color of blood, but it is on a plate and it is in the shape of a flower. And as it sit down, sits on in front of you, they set it down and it wiggles ever so slightly. A live meal. I will conquer it thusly. And I'm not even going to use my utensils. I'm just going to stab me a little digit right in the middle of this beautiful piece of artwork. Just subdue it. For probably the first time, you feel what jello feels like. What is this substance? The chef, who is the one who placed it down in front of you with a proud smile on her face, says, it is a new recipe that I thought of tonight. It is blood jello. Just for you. Miraculous. And I'm just... Uh, uh, do I do I dare say? I'm going to yes. slurp it up. I'm going to gurg it. I'm go girding it. <laughs> just lifting up my plate to my face. And yeah. Uh, and it is... It is the... It is a very light and slippery texture. But it's quite pleasant. Very oh, refreshing. Regulated blood. Refreshing indeed. Slippery. Seeing the delight on your face, the chef gives you a accomplished nod and nods to Zasafel and leaves the room with the rest of those serving you. 
Wow, this is a beautiful... I don't think I've ever had anyone serve me like this before, especially multiple... We have had multiple courses, but not like this. This is amazing. Oh, Zasafel smiles in. If you like this, you will have to come back for our winter solstice feast. Arabelle has not experienced it yet, but we deck out the whole floor and invite everyone who is everyone in the area to come and dine with us. There is food in every room trays, tables. One time, my sister decided that we would do a whole cream puff tower in the shape of a solstice tree. It nearly touched the ceiling. It was delightful. You have the entire town in your in your home for this. And Ellison speaks up, not the entire town. A lot of the prominent business owners and some of our friends from the nearby cities will come in as well. Some more some worship families will come and stay with us for a bit. Just like uh, a private event. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, which which prominent people here in town is like the the wardens, the the temple? Oh, yes. Several of the clerics from the temple are usually here. They do a blessing for us before the meal, and it is it's always a delight to have them come visit the home. And uh, let's see, we have. Let's see, there used to be a silversmith, but they moved away. Um, He used to come and he would always bring some grand silvered sculpture with him. Uh, I believe he'll be coming in from, oh gosh, where did he move to? I believe he moved to O'Crane. Or was it Solskarmi? I don't, I'll I'll have to look at his recent letter. Um, There's also uh, Toby from the Wardens. I'm I'm sure you all are well acquainted. Uh, he comes in and stays with us as well and occasionally um, brings in some of uh, his higher ups to come and uh, take in the festivities. They like to uh, they like to make their presence known, especially during uh, important events around town. Uh, let's see who else. Um, uh, Morthron usually joins us with his wife as well. Um, their children typically don't come, although I hear that the new baby is absolutely adorable. She's uh, so cute. Oh, you've seen her? I was there when she gave birth. Oh, goodness. That is so sweet. I sent over a baby blanket and a big gift basket for all of them. I do hope that they they enjoyed the rattles and the bottles. I haven't been over, unfortunately, to see them myself. I was too busy assisting with the planning of the festival. Did you fund the whole festival, you and your brother? Oh, um, we handle a lot of things that are on the city's end. Um, our family has overseen it for many years, uh, with the assistance, of course, of Iggy over at the tavern. Uh, they have a, a large hand in it as well as, uh, they are the ones who originally proposed the idea of having the festival come and visit, as, um, I believe they're friends with the, uh, the owner of the festival. See, mm-hmm. it's quite a lot of work uh, that goes in for one time of the year, but it sounds like you're used to throwing parties. Oh, the work never stops. There's always something around town to assist with. Well, I'm sorry, you, you were... I'm sorry, what was that? It's just a compliment. Please oh. continue. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, you you were going to say something. What was it? Oh, no. I just was going to say that it sounds spectacular. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. We we do try our best. <laughs> Is there anything else that I can pass you all? Would you would you like some more some more egg rolls or or some more potatoes? I would love some more egg rolls. <laughs> and she will pass them to you. And Zasfel continues on with the pleasant talk. And once more, after another 15, 20 minutes, the Staff comes back in with yet another course and begins plating everything in front of you. However, I will need everybody except for Arat to make a constitution saving roll. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, no. (laughs) Don't eat. I got 20. Oh, this isn't for eating. Okay. I got a 43. What was this course? 23. 23? Okay. Unfortunately, even with a 23, you do not save. As there is suddenly a blinding flash of light from the chandelier above you. 
and a loud crashing sound that comes and rumbles the table underneath your hands. Someone roll me 1d4. Okay. One. Okay. It only takes about a minute. But as you all rub at your eyes and are at your ears with the sound of that crash are ringing, suddenly there is a piercing scream that comes from near you, Yuiza, from the end of the table, from Ellison. And as you all look over to Ellison, she is looking wide-eyed, mouth agape, screaming and pointing, clutching her chest and pointing towards the other end of the table at Zasafel. And as you all turn your heads, you see Zasafel slumped back in his chair, a dagger with the wing of a raven protruding from his chest. And that is where we will go to break. So go ahead and check us out on patreon.com forward slash the hype goblin. If you would like to ask us, ask us questions about this game or any others on the channel, we'll be back in five to 10 minutes. So don't go anywhere unless you grab a drink, grab a friend or go to patreon.com forward slash the hype goblin. We will see you all shortly. Everybody wave. All right. So getting back into it. What just happened? There's a dagger through the mayor's heart. <laughs> I'm gonna get up immediately before anybody like goes to the body. Please do. Because I because I can't just because I can't see it from where I'm sitting, and I want to get a sense of like I want to I see if I can get a sense of where like where the dagger came came from, and you know stuff like was it like if it, if if it was thrown because if nobody was over there. Go ahead and investigate the body. Oh, that's a 19. Okay. As you investigate the entry of the weapon, it is straight on through the chest. That is about as much as you can tell. There is no further indicator of where it would have come from, but the hit itself was straight on. You said, he's, you said he's slumped. Is he like leaned back or is it like he's, straight yeah, on he's slumped? Like slu he's like back, like he got hit and then poof, like weakened it, burned into his chair. Okay, so I'm going to put my finger like like close to like the edge of the dagger and then just like kind of straight line back. With the way he's sitting in the chair, it's pointing straight up. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought you said I thought you said straight on and he was slumped in the no, chair. So I thought straight, it would come like straight across. on in, into his chest when he was sitting up. Right. But if, if he was sitting up, but he is currently slumped down. Well then, okay, well then then I'm I'm go then I'm I'm going in like a straight line from where from where it would have been when he was sitting up, not not straight up in the air. Okay. Like I'm directly across the table from him at the opposite end would be Ellison. Or there is the large open doorway behind her. Okay, this so the doorway's the doorway's open, so mm -hmm. Let's keep everyone who is in the room before the chandelier fell in here. We have questions to ask. Everyone, as far as you know, that is in the house was in the room when the chandelier fell as it was happening as you were being served. So the chef is in here, the maid is in here, and the butler is currently in here as well. So since I'm right next to this guy, uh, A, A, can I smell blood since I'm right on him? And B, can, oh, yeah. I, can I feel for a pulse? I've actually got pretty decent medicine. Uh, yeah, go ahead and feel for a pulse. 24. There's no pulse. Okay. Yeah, that was awfully quick, but where was the dagger even kept? It just seems like it appeared out of midair. What it was thrown directly across. Can I investigate this dagger? It is a dagger that is sunk into the chest of Sassafel. And the handle of it is shaped like the wing of a raven. She will describe it to Ada, so he's also aware what dagger this is. Where was this dagger being kept? The out loud to whoever's there. The staff all looks around, wide-eyed. The maid is clutching a napkin to her chest. The chef still has the serving platter that she was getting ready to set down on the table in front of you all in her hands. And the butler is standing there with his pocket watch in his hand. And they all shake their head 
in bewilderment at your question. And Ellison speaks up from the other end of the table and just, I, I, I've, I've never, I've never seen it before. I, do, do you know where it's, where it's from? If you've never seen it before, then it must have come from his personal collection. I'm trying to figure out where might be clues of where this dagger came from. Well, he, he likes to strewn the things he collects about the house. I, I mean, it's a big house. I don't. And nobody has seen this before. The serving staff and Ellison all look to one another and shake their heads. And Arabelle, you all, the rest of you see Arabelle just silently sitting there with her hands over her mouth, wide eyed, staring at the dead body. Since I'm not actually hearing anybody respond, there's us. Thomas, Thomas, you were cleaning one of the weapons when we encountered you. Did you do you clean all of his weaponry? Just the ones that are on display. That one in particular, he was rather fond of. There, I believe he kept some in his in his study and in his his bedroom as well. I did not maintain those. Then we should. Then if there if there is going to be any evidence of who might have broken into it, it might be a good place to start there. Can everyone please go back to the drawing room? I understand that a lot has happened right now. But we have to figure out who did this because that means we're all in danger. And I would rather you guys not have to look at the body with the knife taken out. Because I'm going to take this out and bring it with us so nobody else that we do not know has a weapon. Because it's either one of us or it's someone else that we have no idea who it is. And Thomas speaks up and... uh, that there are, aside from the ones that are on display here, no one walks these premises armed. This is, this is outrageous. Well, unfounded. clearly, clearly it's founded because it has just happened. So I would like to inspect where this may have been kept to see if we could find any evidence of breaking an entry, anything that might have been left behind by the person who did so, so on and so forth. Perhaps the staff could explain who even has access, who would have keys. Or if that baby, oh, it's like in that book I read. There could be someone in the walls who dropped the chandelier to kill him. I can patrol the grounds at least to make sure that we're safe from the outside. It may be the best start. We are, apologies, at at this point we are, I suppose now, wardens by default. uh, Instead of dinner guests. Also try and see if I can't track anyone leaving the premises. I'll join you, Sulong. You could you could benefit from my superior senses. No offense, of course. Um, I would appreciate it. I know this is a very tough... But someone who knows the grounds very well, if you could take me around so I can take a look at all the... If there's any place that anyone could have hidden or come in through our, without our knowledge... And Thomas looks over to Ellison after you all make these requests. And as the tears begin pouring down her cheek, she looks back and gives a nod of approval that he is to allow you all to have full access to the grounds and the building itself. And he nods back. And ever the dutiful butler opens his coat and um, brings out a set of keys for you all. Thank you. Mari, can you make sure that Arabelle and um, Ellison are are taken to the drawing room and given something hot to drink, please, and a blanket? Yes. Yeah, my, my mother and I will, will take care of that, she says in a, a very soft and melodic voice and the half-orc woman makes her way around the table to Arabelle and gently puts herself in front of Arabelle so she can't see and lifts her by the bottom of the elbows to stand turns her around and ushers her out of the room Ellison gets up on her own as Mari and the chef usher her out of the room as well and the chef turns to the rest of you and my daughter and I will look after them. I'm I'm going to close the drawing room doors, if you don't mind, and let you do your work. Yes, but 
please make sure to you all stay in there for now. And after I fix some tea, we will remain in the drawing room. And with a nod, she closes the door and it slides shut and you are all left in the drawing room with the, with the body of Zasafel Pretorius. I'm going to very quickly whisper into my sleeve uh, for for the, the two uh, small animals that are still left in the two clockwork animals are still in there. I want the, again, they're tiny. I want the cat to go into the drawing room and I want the owl like perched out front. Pretty much okay. the, just the instructions, like if anybody flees, scream. <laughs> Okay. Like, I want alarms at this point. <laughs> I'm going to remove this dagger. Anybody who is squeamish and is labeled the sea, please look away. Um, Adati and I should go investigate his rooms while the other two check for the outside. Yes. Uh, yes I yes, think yes. Uh, now would be a very appropriate time to arm yourselves. I already am. I would like to, I mean, I have a dagger now, technically. She'll point to like, present the murder weapon. Uh, but yes. I mean, uh, the axe. I know. I have my divine uh, strength and these delightful little daggers in my jaw. And I point at my fangs. Oh, I'm not that strong. Um, let's, let's go to the cabinet and we can get our stuff. I should have a key for it here. It, it, well... Hmm. Okay. We are wardens I mean, at the moment. We have reason to be armed. No, yes, I'm. I'm just. I'm. Con- I'm concerned about. Uh, well, we are the newcomers here. Yeah, they're the perfect way to set someone up. I. This is gonna look over her shoulder for just a moment for, getting real close to the rest of the group in a huddle, almost. You, you don't think Arabelle planned this? I mean, she was the one who asked us to help her and attend, and it's awfully convenient to have the newest members of the Wardens, who, whose character has yet to be tested, in a mansion during a murder. I mean, it is possible at this point. I don't know. It, I mean, it sounds as though I'm not anybody... saying I blame her. I just would have preferred to have been informed. Sure. Um... Yeah. While they're having this conversation, can I pat down the body? Yeah, roll me investigation. Oh, that was a natural one, baby. <laughs> Do you have any inspiration to re-roll with? We all should have had an inspiration. I, I think used you, mine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Then I, I don't think I've used mine because I don't remember no, ever using one. I'm the only one. one that has, I think. Okay. okay. I do too. If one of you wants to loan your inspiration as well to another player, you're more than welcome to do that. What Not natural roll? 20. Okay. You go through his th- his pockets and you do find that you find everything that is listed in his inventory on his person. Uh, Temple detailing a storefront recently put up for sale in the meantime we're going to sit both for Taylor's show. Okay. A dagger. I'm going to take that with me. Uh, like put it on the table. Mm-hmm. I think I say I don't roll the guy just yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Like put it on the table. I'll put out the clockwork flyer fly, a pamphlet that she just says it's what's for the tailor shop, the blue quartz, and there's a note that says IOU, IOU notes from the local tavern gambling hall for a sizable amount, 40 gold pieces and five silver pieces. From the tavern? Like the tavern owes him money? Like he owns the tavern money. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he he owes the tavern money. Okay. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. he owes the tavern money. Suspicious. Oh. And I will put. Mm, he has money. He does. He has quite a sum of money. I I will I would like to take that money and put it on the table. Okay. Back to that. <laughs> so, what specifically is, is there a chandelier in the middle of the table? Yeah, the chandelier has crashed the table. Can I check the chain on it? Does it look cut? Does it look burnt off? Go ahead and take a look. Can I sleight of hand that one platinum, please, into my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> Roll your sleight of hand. <laughs> this is RJ giving Sula an excuse not to see. 
<laughs> this, I do not see it. I am not looking. <laughs> 15. Everybody, roll your perceptions for me. Uh, 16. Or no, my investigation on the chandelier was a 16. Okay. My perception for this is... 19, but I say nothing. Mm-hmm. Sulong says nothing. Mm-hmm. Discord, you are muted. I was. I'm going to bite someone. I just want you to right here is like the little jingle of coin. Just, I do not hear it. <laughs> I do not hear it. Yep. You all know that Yuisa took it, but you politely ignore the fact that your friend stitches is taking... get stitches. Yes. Exactly. It's stealing from the rich. It doesn't count. You are looking at it. You're looking to see how it was removed from the ceiling? Yeah, like it, the end chain has been like ripped off or has been cut. It looks like the attachment to the ceiling crashed down and splintered away with it. It wasn't cut, but the the weight of the chandelier itself definitely pulled itself down. With a 16, that's about as much as you're going to get. So long, I have an idea. I, I cannot necessarily gain some runway and fly. Could you throw me up there and I, I could maintain air long enough to look? Too long just turns to Fist and shows her the palm of his hands, which he'll squeeze twice and then stick to a wall. Do you want to oh, come with? I... Yes. Well, hang on then, Spider Monkey. Fiskworth, go ahead and make me a strength check to roll on to Sulong. Sulong, make me a athletics or acrobatics check to maneuver with Fiskworth on your back. 18. 25. I'm hanging on Spider Monkey. Okay, you you two are you two are climbing up the wall together. You know, if we were to have killed the mayor, this would probably have been how we did it. Oh my precisely. Why would have drained him and then blamed the maid? Pause. Okay. And well, yeah. on the ceiling, what are you looking at, Fiskor? I'm looking specifically at the whole where the chandelier fell. Is there like any, is there like an upper level? Maybe someone who may have manipulated the chain inside? Okay. Go ahead and roll me investigation. Do you have any craftsmanship abilities for Fiskworth? I do not. Okay. Let's see how this investigation goes. One minus two intelligence. (laughs) That's a zero. Yeah, it just, it, it's uncanny that it broke and fell at that precise moment. You know, so long, I think it was a ghost. It's just uncanny. Look at it. A ghost was rattling the chains too hard. You know how ghosts are. If I peek into this upper crawl space area and just look around a little bit. There's no crawl space. Oh, so it's just it's, attached it, to the it, ceiling. It was attached to the ceiling and the attachment point crashed down. Hmm. Huh. I'll let you roll your investigation again now that you have a closer look. Do you have any crafting abilities? I do not. Okay. But I do roll with advantage anyway. Okay. To you, while they're while they're doing this, I was was like, we should probably investigate the uh, the mayor's room and storage area while they are examining this, so we can make sure we don't lose any evidence. Let's go. She'll kind of jingle the keys and put them in her bag or like hold them as she's walking with him uh, offering her elbow uh, and trying to look in the different rooms which was the um, the mayor's room okay let's resolve Sulong's role first what'd you get RJ? 14 14? yeah you're not sure either it looks like it literally just ripped itself down from the weight Hmm. Begin to crawl back. Okay. Yuiza and Arat, where are you heading to? The mayor's room slash the storage area, basically where he keeps his personal collection that he was talking about earlier. Because okay. if, if, no, if nobody's truly seen this dagger, then it has to be there. And on the way, I'm hoping to find the little clockwork weasel that I sent looking specifically for this dagger. Okay. On your way there, you do not encounter your weasel. Uh, you will be going to the second floor of the mansion. Let me move you all over. And you come upstairs to a long hallway with the same beautiful wood paneling. There are a few benches in the hall for folks to sit on. 
and it, you can start checking doors. We'll check this door real quick. Okay. You open to a nicely furnished bedroom. It does not look like it has been touched in a while. However, there there are a few items just sitting out and about. It would appear that this is a guest room. Hmm. Okay. okay. She's just going to take a, a cursory look. Mm-hmm. And if she's no, when she notices that it hasn't really been used, she's like, this is in this room. It is not this room. Let's go. Would he be over here, Ada? Or would he be... I'm gonna open this room over here. You open to the next door. And this room is a little more sparsely furnished. It doesn't appear that it's been used in a while. There's a fine layer of dust on some of the furniture. It appears that they haven't been cleaning this one. As they haven't needed it. He has a lot of guest room. Rich people usually do. Okay, let me open this door. Maybe, is this another guest room? <laughs> She's just saying out loud. You open the room and you see feminine items strewn about the room. Hairbrushes, some dresses. You see a small family portrait of the Taurus family sitting over on a dressing table next to some perfume bottles. And do you get the feeling that this is Ellison's room? This is Ellison's room. We should probably just like make sure she had nothing to do with it if she did. We should snoop around is what I was saying. Uh, cursory, yes. Uh, I'll, I will stay here in case somebody is still up here. Okay. It's just uh, She's just gonna look for any like journals or hidden compartments anything that's not like obvious to the to have a cursory glance okay a roaming investigation 15 15 you find some flyers for the festival you find the dinner menu for this evening you notice that in her own handwriting she crossed some things out and made some notes in preparation for y'all's arrival and you also find a small silver necklace in a velvet box mm, all right she is uh, not going to touch that she's going to close it and put it away mm -hmm. I'm just gonna open this door real quick see if anyone's hiding in the bathroom yeah. you open it to uh ellison's bathroom Okay. Luscious clawfoot tub there. Looks like yeah. it would be absolutely divine to take a bath in. Rush people have the most outrageous bath. It's amazing. I want to take a bath in there one day. Uh, okay, nothing out of uh, order, but it does seem like Ellison really is the one that's um, organizing everything. She's the one that uh, kind of plans everything on like her brother, but He's always just been like, you know, I organized this, I did that. So just maybe keeping that in mind, you know, maybe, maybe she had the reason. It is worth considering. I, I am getting the feeling I will simply have to ask everybody uh, and see what I can read. Yes. You are probably better at that than me. And she opens the door to the next room. Well, let's see what that you open the door to a room that's neat and tidy like the rest of the home. However, it's obvious as you look around from the weathering on the walls, Yuiza, that what hung there before has been removed. Probably paintings, portraits of some sort as, as they're square. And the decor here has almost all been completely removed. The bed is missing the bed curtains that hung in the other bedrooms. And there's no furniture in the room aside from the bed, its nightstand, and a large wardrobe, which holds a few sparse but well-made items. Things that you've already seen the mayor wearing. You mm -hmm. get the feeling that this is his room. This is... 
She'll describe the rooms like, this is strange though. Why would the major's room be so empty? It's, em- it's empty, you say? Yes, the, the walls that there's, there were paintings at some point here, but they've all been taken away. There's a mirror and a, a, a wardrobe, but the curtains are all gone. She's going to check. Are there any drawers in here? Yeah, there's the nightstand. Uh, you can go ahead and roll investigation on the room. Would you like the help? Yeah, uh, I don't have much uh, much an investigation uh, on there, but I can. Yeah, you can either roll separately or one of you can roll with advantage. Um, I got an 11. An 11? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you assist Yuiza in searching, and you both start checking into this nightstand. Yuiza, as you're both going through and are at your feeling the objects as they come out, seeing if you get any vibes off of them or if any anything kind of triggers a, a, a sense of it was fate for you to find it, you do find a piece of paper. It's a notice from a local buyer that a shipment of fruit from the estate has been arriving short one crate for the last four months. Additionally, you both find 30 gold, 11 silver, and three copper. And I will need you both to make a perception check. I I got a 22. 22, okay. Perception? That's going to be a 13. 13, (laughs) okay. Yeah. Okay. You both notice this. All right, you feel something pop out as you run your hand along the back of the drawer. And as you pointed out to Yuiza, Yuiza, you notice that Arat's fingers are coming into contact with a concealed latch. Ooh. You just found the secret compartment. I'll cautiously pull said latch. Okay. You pull said latch and it releases the bottom of the drawer and you're able to lift it out like a tray. Beneath that, you you see a lined velvet space with the indentation of a object that is roughly the same shape as the dagger that you have found protruding from the body. Describe this to Arat. It Mm -hmm. seems like this was the resting place of our dear dagger. So the dagger was being kept in his personal room that has been cleared out of nearly all of its belongings. Yes. I you you think that his room would be the most furnished, you know? I feel like... I wonder if the folks downstairs know about this, or... I'm going to walk over, actually, to, to the wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as much, I'm going to run my hand across because you said if you said like with the weathering it feels like the spot was the spot was where like pictures were mm-hmm. is there is there about the same level of dust across or where the pictures were does it feel like it was, they were like recently taken off in some places it feels more recent to you in others they've been gone for a while okay as you're moving along the wall, roll me another investigation check. All right. Uh, that is a 15. 15, fantastic. As you are walking along, you feel a board beneath your foot creak and shift a little bit. Stop and just tap it with my uh, with my stick. This one's moving. What's happened? This board here is loose or perhaps meant to move. She's going to go to where Adit is and like literally just go down the floor and just look at the the board. You do that. And you see that Arat's foot has shifted the board a little bit. So it lifts up. I think I can open it. Go for it. I'll, I'm going to keep my foot on it in case it's like trapped or something, but I'm going to like shift it. 
Yeah. She's going to just go like see where it's loose and just like kind of push it up a little bit more. Okay. You find a small locked wooden box with floral carvings on the outside. Oh, it's a small little treasure box. It is locked, but not for very long. I'm going to use my thieves tools. Please do. She's going to pop them out of like her cleavage. Okay. Um, Proficiency plus dexterity, right? Dex plus pro. Yeah, dex plus proficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, My dex is a four. I rolled a 10. My dex is a four. Uh, And my proficiency is a two. So it's a total of 16. 16? Okay, that's more than enough. You quickly pop this lock open. It's it's cheap, almost akin to what you'd see on like a little kid's jewelry box. Mm, it's not you, that. Yeah, you probably could have popped it open with a butter knife. In this box, you find a small portrait of a young orcish woman and several love letters. Uh, who are the love letters to and from? Do you open them to read them? Yeah, she's going to tell, like, uh, Adam what she found, and she's going to take one and just, like, read through it. Okay. You begin reading through it, and although there are only pet names used, my beloved, my dear, you get the sense that one of these people was... Zasfel, as it begins talking about his, one of them talks about his position at the estate, what his family expects of him, and it is essentially breaking off the relationship with the other person. And a later one is splotchy. Some of the ink has run. It's it's you think it might be tear stained based on its contents as the writer of this letter in a precise handwriting not not looping like Zasafel's trained script is is writing begging him to acknowledge the birth of his daughter is is the porch the orcish woman in the portrait does she look like mari Roll me insight. Or, or does she, or does she look like Mari's mother? Because she, I remember her mentioning, her, "My mother and I will take care of this." <gasps> I know, but how old is Mari? Um, shit. Okay, let me roll. Um, oh god, numbers. <laughs> what am I rolling? Insight. Yeah. Insight. Yeah. Can you figure out what someone looks like when they're younger? Seventeen. Yeah. Good enough. This, the resemblance is, is there. It is a young cleaver, the chef. Wait. Okay. Um, <laughs> give me a second. Anna. I think. Wait, so cleaver is. The cleaver chef is the and the mother of. Yeah. And the mother of Mari. Quite possibly. Okay, I just gonna like put the the letters back, put the portrait back, and take the the uh, the little box and put it in her bag. This, there's love letters in here. Yes. And uh, they're between. There's it's definitely Sasquatch. I mean, look at. I mean, you can't look at it, but the handwriting, uh, the descriptions, um, and. There's one last letter. He's breaking it off with like this this person, uh, asking them to acknowledge their daughter. And the portrait is of a young cleaver, the chef, who's the mother of Mary. Interesting. So Sassafrel and Cleaver used to be together, and he broke it off. But he got so pregnant and they had Mari. Two things come to mind with that. 
The first being that apparently the mayor has an heir. Yeah. If she were to be acknowledged. The second, quite possibly less important, but why does he have his own letter that he wrote to her? How did he get it back? I don't know. Because this is both sides of the conversation, which means that he or somebody had both sides of the conversation and stored them together. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't seem like this box is, I mean, the lock was pretty sh cheap. I mean, if I were the mayor, I would probably keep this under like very tight lock and key. I could have broken this with a butter knife, but I mean, she could have just handed him all the letters back. It's possible. The thing is that this does not narrow down their suspect. <laughs> Because oh, no. Ma Maddie could have done it because well, of, you know, um, spiteful, uh, unacknowledged child. Weaver could have done it because, you know, he's with Arabelle now. Arabelle could have done it. The sister I, could have done it because of an heir. I, I don't think, I don't think Arabelle did, but I think that perhaps the sister could be considered. Yes, sorry, Liam. As you two are having this conversation, let's check back in with Fiskorth and Sulong. Fiskorth and Sulong, what are you two up to as the others explore the top floor of the, or the uh, second floor? If Fiskorth is still hanging on to Sulong, he has not made a move to remove her from his shoulders. But uh, I guess they're going to investigate the grounds. That's cool. Okay. Where are you heading out onto the grounds? Maybe we're checking the gardens. There's lots of trees, plants, shrubberies to hide in. Assuming that the... And if the murderer fled, we'll find footprints there. True, 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 true. Because they could have, and Fist, like, just this dramatic reenactment, which is a little insensitive, but, like, she just rushes to the door, makes a very exaggerated dagger throw, and then zooms to the side. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I see what you're saying. That still doesn't rule out anyone in the drawing room, though. If they were to flee, we would find Prince out in the garden, but if the killer is in the drawing room, then, well, going out there might be for nothing. I'm glad this will need to pick up track sense, maybe even. Well, they wouldn't have gotten close enough to get him bloody, I presume, but I'll follow you. I think the gardens are worth checking. Yeah, uh, well, if this is adamant about it, uh, so long I'll head out to the gardens with them. We'll scout around for any footprints that don't belong. Yeah, go ahead and roll me investigation. So I don't roll a zero again. I rolled the four. This honey. I have an 18. You don't find any footprints that you would see as unusual. You see where you all came in. And you see some prints around the garden area, but nothing that you can particularly discern as being the murderer's footprints. There's no telltale pools of blood in any of them. As you look back towards the house, though, you do see the large windows off the back of the house of the conservatory. And you see the windows of the other front room of the house, the library. As well as off to the side, you see the windows leading to a study. And you can all see, and you can see clearly into these windows as well. It's quite been a good plotting point if someone were to follow the mayor about, hide in this garden, see what rooms he was in, wait until he was in the dining room for the perfect opportunity to strike. Mm. Do you think we might if we break some windows and look around in there? They're all open, Fist. We don't need to break any of them. I thought we were supposed to do that in Murder Mysteries. No, that's after the person's been murdered, you break a window to escape. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Check the study first. Perhaps they left their notes of murder in there. You're going back inside to the study? If C Long's okay with it, then you... Yeah. If the window's just open, I could just jump into the study. <laughs> the windows are not open. Well, if this wants to break a window... Okay, yeah, we'll go back inside and head on up to the study. Okay. I will move you over to the study. Passing through the doors, you enter the study. The cozy room is dominated by a large, ornate mahogany desk and a large, high back leather chair with wood arms. In front of the desk are two smaller leather chairs and a small tea table. The parquet wood floors are covered by a lush green rug, and the walls are lined with small bookshelves. 
above which a large hand-painted mural adorns the walls. What's the mural of? It's of a woodland scene, quite fae-like in nature almost. It's rather magical looking. There's a unicorn peeking out from behind a tree. There are some frogs sitting on lily pads, some oddly colored mushrooms growing amongst the bushes near the base of trees. Maybe get a piece at a cursory sniff. Like maybe there is an assassination attempt before this. Is there any smell of bitter almonds? <laughs> Go ahead and investigate. Oh boy. Six, man. I'm doing such a good job. It's fine. DC was actually five. It just smells minty. Well, maybe this was a crime of passion and it happened suddenly. So long, do you think we could look into that desk? Maybe we could snap it in half with your bulging muscles? So long, just try the drawer. Yeah. <laughs> the drawer opens. Go ahead he and roll flexes me in- for fist court. <laughs> <laughs> roll me investigation, please. 15? 15, okay. But you find... Several things with a 15. You find an accounts ledger, a bag of 150 gold pieces, a letter sealed with the Petaurus family seal, the same one that is above the the front doors as you walked in. Is there a letter opener on the desk? Yeah, we'll say there is. Uh, Sulong will put the letter down onto the desk and take the letter opener. He'll mm-hmm. cast Produce Flame to heat the blade. Okay. So that he can... Well, is the letter wax sealed? Yeah, it's wax sealed. Yeah, so he can just melt underneath the wax seal and pop it open. Yeah, sure. You do that, and wax seals are actually pretty easy to get off. I've done it myself a few times. This letter is a letter of inquiry about the empty storefront in town. And... There are also three small wrapped candies in the envelope as well. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, the growing brain was just like, how? Do you eat one? No. You can? Never it's strength. evidence. This is a murder scene. Would you like to investigate any of the other items? Yes, please. Okay. How many rolls am I making? I just need to know if you're opening them or not to look. Yeah. Okay. Looking at the accounts ledger for the estate, then you flip through it and you did bookkeeping on the farm, right? Yeah. Yeah. You take note of this. There are some oddly noted transactions, but that could be due to the unusual shorthand that Zasafel appears to be using in these ledgers. It also details payments covering the expense for the creation and zoning of the community garden in town run by the estate's head gardener, Hardwick Castlebaum. He spent multiple thing, uh, multiple piles of gold on something called the candy, but he spelt it with an I. Or perhaps be a person? Is there anyone in town with such a sweet name? No, I, I think that's irrelevant data. Um, it does look like, though, he... Can I try to make heads or tails of the shorthand? With, like, an intelligence check? Go ahead and just roll me straight intelligence. Two. You're not sure? It's some kind of shorthand that he was using. All right. Um, so a lot of the store, well, there's a letter here, which designates something of, um, corresponds regarding a storefront in town. Uh, ledgers are a bit weird, but I can't make heads or tails of them. Hmm. Perhaps his sister might have an idea of what it is. Her siblings tend to be taught together. Perhaps he knows something of this strange tongue and maybe what this candy might be. Right, right. What do we do about the gold? Well, uh, you know, it's evidence, but we can just... He might have had it on his person. Perhaps he spent it on this candy. Uh, oh, no, it's going into my, my chest. For, it's gone. It's gone. It's vanished. I closed my eyes for just a moment. It's gone. Tragedy, sorrows. We'll come back for it. <laughs> Do you look anywhere else in the room? There are bookshelves here, correct? Yeah, there are. Yeah. <gasps> oh, this is 
because again, she's read too many murder mysteries, gonna test every single book to see if there's a stunt book in there. Okay. So long are you helping with this? Yeah, sure. I'll give advantage okay. uh, to this yeah. roll. Just roll with advantage. Give me investigation. I got stinky, dirty, nasty 20. You find letters that slip out of one of the books. I immediately scoop them up, hold them up to my beady little eyes and start reading. Okay. This is murder, obviously. You start going through these and you notice that it's not written with ink. These appear to be copies of a letter created with carbon paper. And they come from a town guard, noting that Hardy and Thomas were getting close publicly at a recent town festival. A copy of a criminal record for one goblin Thomas Curry is included with the letter and it comes from a nearby city. The charges were from their youth and a third letter addressed to Thomas on thin carbon paper detailing the information threatens to reveal it to the local townsfolk. Oh, so I believe this is what they call blackmail. Look at this. So there's a great secret that Thomas has threatened to reveal. Perhaps this has something to do with what your little dragon friend was asking about the maid and the maybe there was an affair. Maybe they were having group events. What? You know, when everyone, they host parties with their owners knowing, clearly. But this might be worth bringing up with the others. Maybe they found something in his quarters. All right. uh, Probably not his sister, because if this is information that was being threatened with, she might act perversely. Uh, Not like likely to act nicely about it, I should say. Not perversely. God, no. Does the letter mention the conditions of the blackmail, aside from threatening to reveal Thomas's identity? Does not. Hmm. Let's look around a bit more and reconvene with Arat and Yuiza. It's most certainly. Maybe there's there's hidden tunnels on the walls and there's a, a phantom who lives at the bottom of it, but we'll have to see that. I'm going to start knocking the walls with my big ears next to him. Uh, Sulong will, as they're heading out the room. That reminds me of a horror story, actually. Uh, you see, there once was this elderly couple who hired a nanny to watch over a doll. Um, <sighs> the doll itself had a strict... Uh, list of rules that the nanny had to follow. Uh, Don't leave spare food out. Listen to the music really loudly when doing some things. Um, Strange things would happen around the doll. Sual says as he's walking. Um, The food set out for the doll would be eaten. Um, Things would go missing in the night only to appear somewhere else. It was later found out that uh, the elderly couple's son who was alleged to have died earlier was living in the walls and the nanny was there to caretake for the doll slash man in the walls. This looks petrified as Sulong tells the story and suddenly the appeal of looking for phantoms in the walls is no longer as fun. What if there's a boy in there? What if he eats your food? Where are you all going next? Conservatory? Conservatory. conservatory. Okay. You head out the door and the conservatory door is right next to this one. Two tall, narrow, blonde, bronze plated doors with glass window panes reveal a view to you of the conservatory beyond. The two story tall, arching metal structure stands against the brick wall of the main house. Ferns and tropical plants create a winding pathway through the room, obscuring some of it from your view. Do you go in? Oh, fuck no, that's scary as shit. That is really free. Why? <laughs> I feel like he sacrifices people in here. This old waltz in, you know, do that like whole bell and her library thing. You you go in and begin twirling around this court. And as you do, make me a perception check. <laughs> I throw up. <laughs> Let's do perception. That's a 13. 13. You hear a rustling from around the pathway, just out of view. Sounds like something large. Suddenly, like, I switched from Disney princess mode to apex predator and just turned my head towards it, scamper over to where I heard and look for it. Okay. 
fit this? Do you leave Sulong behind? Oh, absolutely. She's gone full hunter mode. Her ears are pointing at this thing. Okay. As you do this, you come around the corner and you see a figure hunched over in long gray robes bending down towards the ground. They're not making much of a sound except for the rustling of the plants around them. So long, I, you heard that, didn't you? The scampering, the rustling about, do you believe it was this wild boy or maybe even a murderer? Looking into the scene, what? What? And as you do this, Sulong, at the exclamations of both of you about wall boys and murders, the robed figure stands up to his full six foot four height and turns around with his garden trowel and basket in hand and, oh, oh. Hello, did you did you need something from the gardens? As you come face to face with the gardener, Hardwick Tasselbaum. You said 6'4", though? 6'4". Long, long, gray Gandalf beard. Uh, you're the gardener, correct? Oh, yes. Is there something I can do for you? I'm, I'm afraid that your name escapes me. Have we met before? No, but yes, we were invited by, well, the, by the mayor. Uh, I'm the escort, and this is you along. We're members of the wardens. Ah, from it, Dolan. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, we, if I might make a humble request for you to get to the drawing room, please. There's been a situation. A situation? Oh, dear. Are the, are the young, are the young Patorses all right? Uh, well, um... When half of them is all right, well... Mm. Yes and no. Oh, oh dear. Y yes, Wait, where where would you like me to go? Um... Uh, the drawing room. Uh, actually, how about I take... Uh, here, take my, take my arm. I should escort you there. It's a very serious matter. I'm pretty sure your uh, employers could use the support. Oh, oh, all right, all right, uh, one, one moment. And Hardwick moves slowly, Fiskworth, as you usher him out. This is not someone that you can move quickly, as this gentleman is quite old. But he does set down his basket and his, his garden trowel, and he will follow you back to the drawing room. I bet he knows all the gossip. I'm going to milk him dry. All right. What do you two do next? I'm going to take a look around the conservatory. Okay. While you begin doing that, go ahead and do a investigation roll. I will check back in on you in a moment. But Yuisa and Arat, what are you doing? So I have one place I want to go before we go back to the drawing room. Okay. Uh, if you wish to go with it, and I want to, while we have the keys, I want to check the uh, the service quarters, like the room of the chef, the maid, the butler, mm -hmm. so they have on premise living, okay. and don't like come in from outside all the time. All right, I will put you on that map. That is the topmost floor of the house. To get there, you go back towards the stairs where you originally arrived on this floor. But there is a small door off to the side. And as you open it, it opens to a landing with a narrow staircase behind it. And as you look down, it goes down to the fl floor below you and it goes up. And you surmise that the floor you are trying to reach is the one above. And I will put you both on the map as these stairs open up into a sparsely decorated, putting it kindly open space you see extra shelving along one wall with plates and cups and napkins seeming seemingly storage for those who primarily stay up here there is a simple oak desk or a simple oak table with six chairs none of which are pushed in properly there are plates on the table as well waiting to be laden with food for an upcoming meal. And you see a hallway with several doors. 
uh, the re- request to is mm-hmm. is I, I want to very quickly see if any of the missing materials from the uh, from the mayor's room may have wound up in one of these bedrooms here. Okay. Uh, we could quickly. also check if um, there were missing fruit shipments, I think, as well. Possibly, uh, though that could that could be connected. It could be something separate, but we definitely mm-hmm. have things missing in the place where the dagger would have been taken. Mm-hmm. I mean, also, like, who else knew about that um, secret compartment? That is a question to be asked. Out of curiosity, are there any dates on the letters that you found? Are they recent? Are they old? Is there no way to tell? Well, were there any dates on the letters? There are no dates, but the paper does have that old feel to it. It doesn't, it's not quite brittle, but it gets kind of that like linen-y texture over time. I was going to say, like, how old did uh, Cleaver look in the picture and how old does Cleaver look now? There looks to be about roughly a 20 year difference. Okay. Okay. She will explain that, like, it's not super old paper, but the cleaver looks like about 20 years younger in the photo, in the picture. Well, well right? that's certainly... Painting. <laughs> the painting. That certainly uh, rules out any crime of passion. It's not I a start-of-the-moment thing. Maybe well, something could have picked up again. Be 20 um, years later. My thought my thought would be, if anything picked up again, it would be of uh, his daughter being of an age where she could legally inherit things. That is true. Let's go see into the rooms really quickly. If Mari is the one to be uh, suspected here, let's see if we can find hers. The first room is full of bunk beds, two of which appear to be used regularly. There's a small table in here as well with a few personal items on top. There is a spare set of butler's clothes as well, hanging over one chair. It seems this might be Thomas's room. It's just a spare set of butler clothes. I'm going to open this little wooden trunk, see if there's anything in there. Go ahead and when you try to open it, you realize it's locked. So go ahead and roll your thieves tools for me. Uh, thieves tool. Rogue enrichment time. It is rogue enrichment time. Uh, I rolled a 19 plus 4, which is 23, plus 2, which is 25. Okay. What was the total? 25. 25? Uh, Yeah, you open this lock. It's a standard lock. You're well-practiced in opening this type. And you open it, and you see a bunch of clothing neatly folded. Nothing too particularly flashy. As you start moving things about, you find a... The one thing that does stand out to you is a handkerchief that is neatly embroidered with initials on it. What are the initials? T.C. And they're in a lovely embroidered script. Oh! If I'm not mistaken, okay, so the butler and the maid were supposedly in the a relationship. They were supposedly engaged and broke it off. Yes. And uh, I found a handkerchief with TC, I was doing Thomas and whatever his last name is. My last name is, I was doing Mari maybe made this for him. It's possible. Maybe. Um, but if that relationship was still going, I don't know, like if... You know, Sassafel is a father. Maybe he didn't agree with Thomas and Marty seeing each other. It is highly possible, which would then make Thomas, Thomas a potential suspect if yeah. we're ro- ro- roping things into here. But again, the, the one that has all the keys. That's true. Uh, should I take this handkerchief as evidence? I don't think so. I think we know, we already know that they were together. Okay, I'm just gonna put it back where it was. Do you want to check under like the mattresses or the bed or the pillow, see if there's any notes? Uh, Anywhere that you think might be pertinent. At this point, I'm looking for the very large amount of things that are missing. Uh, Oh, that's true. Just gonna real quick stick my hands between the mattresses. 
Um, but uh, if nothing gets produced, then I will go into the next room, like open it for both of us. I will relock the trunk. Well, sorry, I just realized I was muted. What was your investigation check on the beds? Oh, um, not good because that was a natural one. You failed me, goblin dice. <laughs> That's okay. Fails are important too. But yeah, no, there's there's nothing here. They're just some slightly unmade beds. Uh, no bugs, no money. It's clean and cleaned out. Oh. Let's keep moving. So just, let's see what we can find. Yeah, before you go to the next room, too long. What were you investigating? Uh, checking out the conservatory, uh, giving okay. it a look. I got a 21 for an investigation. All right. Fantastic. As you look around, you see that there's not much beyond plants here. Tucked in an inconspicuous corner is a small potter's table with some common gardening supplies stored on it and including some pots. In back in one corner of the conservatory behind a large fern, you do find a stack of empty pots and a apple crate that is half full of freshly picked apples. And you see something shiny wedged between two of the pots. Shift the pots over and take up the shiny. Okay. As you do, you pick up this object and you pull out wedged between the two pots a ice pick. What? What is that awfully sharp device you're holding? <laughs> Turns to Fiskorth. <laughs> what? Like the what you've been He told me, you know, back in the day, you could buy a house with only one platinum piece. It's not like the 30,000. Lovely discussion. But where'd you find that? Uh, I found this ice pick tucked between two pl- uh, pot plants. Might I smell it? The pot plant, sure. And it, no, the ice pick. Oh. Is there blood on this thing? No, it smells like metal. Well, it's untainted by sanguine embrace. Nobody's used it to stab, but why take such a sharp implement and hide it under a bunch of apples? Is it to keep it fresh and rusty? No, that's not how I think that works. Sulong will tuck the ice pick into his, like, belt. Okay. Anything else you wish to do in the conservatory? No, if nothing else looks out of place here, I think we'll head back to the drawing room to meet up with you, Ezen and Rob. Okay. You got some gossip. Speaking of those two, what room are you going into next, Yuiza? Upstairs in the attic. The run right next to it. Okay. You go ahead and you head inside. You again see two beds. One is neatly made with a trunk sitting at the end. And it's almost like the bed and the trunk have been wedged into a corner to make room for the rest of the room. In On the other side, there is another bed. The blanket on this one matches the one on the bed wedged into the corner. However, this one someone has taken and around the edges done a beautiful decorative stitch with a thick piece of yarn. At the table next to this bed, all food items and personal items have been cleared away and there are pieces of paper all over the bed with sketches on them and taking up the largest space in the room at the foot of this bed is a well-worn dressmaker's form with a few pieces of cloth tacked to it. She's going to go to that uh, bed with the nice, like, yarn embroidered. She'll describe the room to Ada, then suggest that it seems like this one might be Mari's bed, uh, and maybe Heather's. Uh, she'll try to open the trunk that seems to be Mari's. When you open this trunk, there are scraps of fabric neatly folded. Not enough of any one fabric to make a garment, but it appears that she has just been storing what she can in this trunk. There is an assortment of thread. Most of the bobbins are partially or mostly used up. And at the very bottom, 
on a small gold gold chain is a little a little heart charm. Looks to does be a bracelet. It, okay, does it open or is it just a heart charm? It's just a charm. Okay. She will put it back. Telling Ada what she found, but nothing too suspicious. And she will quickly just open the other trunk. Uh, just in case. Because if it is Cleaver, so she wants to make sure there's nothing suspicious there. Or if there okay. is. You open the trunk and it is neatly folded or close. This does appear to be Cleaver's items as there is another chef's jacket included in here. A few personal items, a portrait of Mari when she was a little girl. And tucked into the back, you find a small note written in written in a hand similar to the letters that you found earlier, but newer. She going to read it. <laughs> okay. And it says, once and for all, I am giving you this money and then speaking of this no more. I have no heir and this money will see to it that you will keep quiet. Money. So, creepy person and horrible dad. Got it. She will read oh. the note to Arat. Well, now I am leaning again towards towards her, and there is your potential uh, reopened wound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm keeping this note. I'm keeping this note. It, in a, that would make more sense because it wouldn't make as much sense for this for his sister to kill the one person that could that could uh, prove an heir if he himself was denying it. Yeah, that is true. And if it was, if it was, Allison, why not go for Mari? Let's uh, let's check the other rooms. From the sound of it. There are more rooms than there are people here. Yes. Let's open this room. <laughs> there are. And as you go to check the other rooms and begin forming your theories, that is where we will call it for tonight. And we will resume next week. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for tonight's episode of Luck and Chaos. Don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform of choice. It really helps our show grow. Arat was played by Zachary Vaudo. Yuiza was played by Alyssa Vamp. Fiskorth was played by Abby. Sulong was played by RJ. And your GM and producer today was Sarah Roberts. The Luck and Chaos theme, A Twist of Fate, was composed by SneakerNet. Download it now on Bandcamp. Link in the show notes below. Check out our show notes for cast info and links to the third-party content featured in this game. If you'd like to join us for our Patreon-only after show, visit us on patreon.com forward slash thehypegoblin. This show and others like it are made possible by the generous support from our patrons.